I'm presenting that. The title is uh, The Potential of Summer Rain in a Mediterranean Climate and the Prospect for C4 uh, Vegetation Expansion into the Eastern Mediterranean during Glacial Cycles. The slide that you see um, in the background is from the Okavango Delta in Botswana. It's a region that looks very lush and uh, very rich in uh, uh, um, fauna, but it's rich not because of local conditions, but because of water that is brought to the region by rivers. So it creates sort of um, an appearance of a very wet region in reality. Um, without the water that is input from other locations, you won't get this kind of uh, uh, biome. So my talk today will be giving you an overview about C4 plants. I'm going to uh, spend some time explaining Mediterranean climate, which is not conducive for C4 plants. I will provide an overview of paleoclimate proxies that are used in the Eastern Mediterranean to look at past climates during glacial cycles, and glacial cycles is between uh, last uh, uh, interglacial cycle and uh, glacial cycles are uh, from about 130,000 years ago until uh, recently. And then I'll put everything together. Um, if time will permit, um, I'll talk more. We'll see how um, I manage with the slides. So this is an image of uh, the southern Levant or eastern Mediterranean region. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And we have the vast Saharan Arabian deserts. The region is interesting as a, a climate gradient between the north tropical desert belt at around um, latitude of 30 north that transition into the Mediterranean climate as you uh, uh, move forward northward. The area is interesting being the uh, only land bridge that connects between uh, Africa and Eurasia. And it has been uh, uh, shown over and over again that this uh, land bridge has been used by uh, hominins in uh, expansions out of Africa. Uh, those are um, early modern humans uh, that were uh, found in the southern Levant, the uh, only place where you find these uh, early modern humans out of Africa. Um, and the question raises, how did they make their way through uh, when you have more than two 2,000 kilometers of uh, uh, extreme desert um, that you have to cross on your way from East Africa where we find earlier uh, modern humans um, and the rest of Eurasia. So as I said, my overview will start with C4 plants. Before we start with plants and look at the reasons why C4 vegetation uh, uh, evolve at first place. The picture that you see here is of a very specific large protein called Rubisco. Rubisco is an enzyme and a very conservative enzyme that evolves initially about three and a half billion years ago. So it's one of the earliest uh, proteins that have a functional role in uh, uh, our world. And its uh, sole role initially was to carboxylase. So it captures CO2 from the atmosphere and turn it into a biomass, into sugar. So this is a very important role and it's in the base of our existence as organisms. Later on, when uh, the concentrations of oxygens are starting to rise up, we discover that Rubisco has a second role. It doesn't only carboxylate, it also uh, works as oxygenase. So if you have enough oxygen around, instead of producing biomass, it does uh, uh, photorespiration, it breathes and doesn't produce mass. It's a bit of a problem. So, C4 vegetation appears 
as an adaptation to conditions where the concentrations of CO2 are low or CO2 starvation and you are, are a, a starting to face a demand for a mechanism that will allow to concentrate CO2 from atmosphere when you bring it into the cell of the plant to uh, manage to produce biomass. That happens in a more recent geological time, and this one is in million years, not in billion years. As uh, we see a rise in, in oxygen level, we also see a decline and a pretty rapid, and well, rapid in millions of years, uh, decline in CO2 pressures. We see change, this is in uh, CO2 concentrations that are measured by different proxies, and this is oxygen isotopes that are measured in deep uh, sea uh, uh, cores, in carbonate. And we see there is a drop in temperature, and with the drop in CO2 and temperature, we see also a appearance in the fossil record of C4 grasses and later on canopods. In terms of the anatomy and physiology, what uh, makes uh, the C4 grasses so uh, successful in concentrating CO2, on the left hand side we see a cross section of a leaf of a, C, a, a very generic C3 uh, plant. In the bottom there is the stoma, stomata. Through there, the CO2 can enter into the leaf, and in the process, when you open yourself to um, enter the CO2, you also uh, transpire water. So this is a bit of a wasteful process when you're trying to get enough CO2. The CO2 enters into the plant, Rubisco, as an enzyme, accepts the CO2, and uh, form a three carbon uh, compound, when it's doing it, it's doing it in a way that, and it happens here, sorry, in the um, mesophyll cells, in the spongy mesophyll cells. So this is the stoma, this is the place. If you want to see the, compare the uh, anatomy to the function. If the atmospheric composition of CO2, the carbon, is minus seven, Rubisco is doing a very strong fractionation, if he can, against the heavy carbon. And you end up producing carbohydrates with a negative delta C13 value between minus 22 to minus 34. I'm not going to get into that, but there is a quite range and negatively fractionated relative to the atmospheric values. In C4 plants, you have a new anatomy that is uh, being uh, 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 produced by the plants, the C4 plants, and it varies. Uh, but not by a lot. The idea of C4 plants is that they are uh, separating the process of initial CO2 fixing with the uh, final production of sugar by Rubisco. So it happens in two separate cells. You have the mesophyll cells that were where Rubisco used to be now, they're occupied by a, a second enzyme that does the initial fixing. And later on, you get uh, um, the carboxylation by Rubisco. It happens in bundle sheets. So this is unique anatomy that is different than what we see in C3 plants. It's called Kranz anatomy. So if you are um, a bio, uh, um, a paleo uh, plant uh, physiologist, you're looking in the fossil record for this kind of anatomies to see the earliest uh, appearance of C4 plants and uh, how that evolves. Of course, you can also measure the isotopic composition of those if the preservation is permitting. So, what happens here? The enzyme that C4 plants are using for initial fixing of a carbon is PEP carboxylase. The great thing about PEP is its affinity for CO2 is much higher than that of Rubisco. So it uh, captures a uh, carbon or CO2 uh, in a very rapid process. This allows this tomato to close without losing a lot of water. 
the PP releases the uh, um, uh, CO2 in a four, uh, uh, so move it in a four carbon uh, compound and releases it as CO2 back in the bundle sheet. This effectively is producing a pump, a pump that concentrates CO2 inside the leaf and releasing it in a closed, in a closed uh, system inside the bundle sheet cells. There Rubisco has now ample amount of CO2 and when it uh, fixes the CO2 there is no fractionation because this is a closed system. The amount of CO2 is limiting and all of the CO2 that enters into the bundle sheet is now fixed as carbohydrate. So if you look at the isotopic composition of atmospheric CO2 carbon that enters and become fixed, those values are very close. This is minus 4 to minus 16. So one would ask, if it's a closed system, how come it's not the same? The reason that it doesn't work, and this is work of a, a plant biologist, Farquhar, and others, there is a bit of leakage between these uh, cells, and the leakage is responsible to a, some degree of flow of CO2 that was not captured by PEP, and uh, this one uh, uh, can shift the values to uh, slightly less uh, um, or more negative values than what you uh, expect in a pure closed system. So, they have distinct isotopic values, carbon, and the whole story of a, a paleoclimate and hominins in East Africa is based on C3, C4 uh, games and diets. And the secondary thing that comes with that, the whole idea of evolutionary was to cope with, with reduced atmospheric CO2 conditions. The byproduct of that is that you are, C4 plants are excellent in water use efficiency because they don't waste a lot of water in the process of fixing carbon. Another very interesting thing related to uh, uh, C4 plants is because you have an additional metabolic step associated with the fixing of carbon, it's costly energetically. It means you need more energy in the form of light. It means that the whole process of biomass productivity is slightly slower compared to C3 plants in a given environment. If this is optimal conditions for C3 and C4 plants, C3 plants will always produce more biomass than C4. C4 plants need a lot of sun to uh, 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 photosynthesize. This is a seminal paper by Leringer and Bjorkman from 1977, where they looked at the impact of rising temperature on the ability of a Rubisco to fix CO2. C3 plants, and what they show is that low temperature, and this is C4 plants, the biomass productivity of C3 plants is higher. So they will, if this is an environment, it will be a C3 environment under optimal conditions for C3. When the temperatures are rising up, Rubisco affinity for oxygen increases. So instead of producing biomass, they uh, photorespirate, so they just breathe, but don't produce plant matter. So in high temperatures, C3 plants are reducing their biomass productivity. And C4 plants, because the CO2 is entering into, into the plant through a pump system, Rubisco never meets oxygen, it always meets only the CO2 that it is, is introduced to, him, to it in the cell by, by a PP. And then you see no change in biomass productivity. So from a certain temperature, the C4 plants are producing more than C3 plants. That's the reason why in tropical environments, the grasses, tropical grasses are C4 grasses and not C3 grasses because they produce better at high temperatures. So that's enough for physiology, sorry for that. But if we look at plant families, and C4 plant families there are, so the C4 mechanism has been uh, uh, invented 
by different plant uh, uh, genera uh, at least 45 times. So it's not one invention, it's not like inventing the wheel, it's something that plants came up with this great idea through a, a secondary adaptation over time in different families, no less than 17 families. So, um, but some of the guiding lines are very similar. The graminoids or grasses and sedges, the one that you see in this slide, um, are typical to tropical environments. They evolved initially to uh, a cope with low uh, CO2 pressure. They're doing exceptionally well in places where the temperature during the growing season is high, plus high water availability. So when you take high water availability, you take high temperature, you get um, these uh, grasses and sages dominating landscapes. If you cover them by shade, not enough energy for them, they will disappear. So they're like open environments. Canopods, which is another uh, big group of uh, C4 uh, plants, those are annuals and shrubs. Those evolved slightly later to deal with uh, arid conditions. They're very efficient with uh, water use and they uh, appear also in saline environments. So when you find, if you're a botanist and you're interested to see uh, climate, grasses, if there is C4 grasses, are associated with tropical conditions. Canopods are associated with desertification, so aridification of landscapes. So these are very different environments. The factor that is shared by both is that they like a lot of sun. They won't appear in places that are shaded. This is a study by Collins and Allen and shows the distribution of C4 grasses across the world. And of course, this is a, as a model, the things that I already mentioned. The reason why you'll find these red patches, these are C4 dominated landscapes, you'll find them in places where the temperature during the growth season and the availability of water is high, where the temperatures are low or the season is not conducive because it's a cold temperature growth. You'll see the blue areas, those are dominated by C4, uh, C, C, uh, C3 grasses. And places where you have two rainy seasons, you get winter and summer growth, you'll find a mix between C3 and C4 biomes. Why do I mention uh, CO2 pressure? If the CO2 pressure drops down, C4 vegetation will appear in places that right now are dominated by C3 plants because they concentrate the CO2 in a more efficient way, they lose less water when they are uh, uh, photosynthesizing. Now, so we understand that C4 uh, expansion or a uh, dominance over landscapes is associated with climate. Now I can shift into the Mediterranean climate starting in the tropics. The global map that you see here is a, a map that represents global temperature in different regions. The upper one is in July and the lower one is in January. First appearance, they look the same. So the highest temperature is in the tropics. That's where solar radiation is the highest and then it dissipates through the second law of thermodynamics from places with high energy to places with low energy. And that's how we try to equilibrate temperature in the world and that's why we have weather patterns because when you do that, you become violent, especially when you fly. Now, the second, oh, it's hard to see. I hope you can see that. The second thing that I want to show you is this line. This is the line where the highest uh, level of energy is being uh, recorded it's in the tropical, intertropical convergence zone. I'll talk about it in a second. And this shift between summertime in its northern location to, summer, to uh, wintertime when it's in the southernmost location. So it varies between the seasons. It's not always at the same spot. It's either above the equator or it's below the equator. What causes that? That's the, uh, the axis of rotation of Earth or the obliquity.
So on the right hand side, this is um, egg yolk. No, that's the sun. And it's now warming up the Earth. What you see as the axis that uh, crosses it diagonally, uh, this is the magnetic north. So the North Pole, the South Pole, and Earth is tilted relative to the Sun. The angle of tilt is 23.5 degrees. And why is that important? Because it determines seasonality. Right now, Earth is tilting, the northern part is tilting towards the Sun. It's what does it mean in terms of the uh, seasonality? Which one is sun? Uh, is it summer and which one is winter? Is this uh, winter or summer? Summer, because it's closer to the sun. The place that gets most of the radiation right now, the highest radiation relative to its distance to the sun, is not the equator, but it's the uh, Capricorn line at 23 north. So this is the place that is right now in the summer. And the southern locations are in the winter. Now, Earth, Galileo was pretty clever. He discovered that Earth is rotating around the sun and not vice versa. So if you take the Earth and you move it to the other side, and it's still tilting in 23 degrees, the seasons are going to be reversed. The southern hemisphere now is going to be summer, and the northern hemisphere is going to be winter. That's why we have seasons. If you calculate it over time, and this is in hundreds of thousands of years, we'll see change in Earth's obliquity. The differences is about one and a half degrees. Why do I tell you that? Because one and a half degrees is not a lot. It means that when you have sun that is beaming over 23 north, it might beam at the maximum about a degree above, which is only a few, you know, 100 or 200 kilometers to the north. It's not a big deal. But that's, in our Earth's history, that's always the same case. The intensity might be different. So, we are now at the tropics. This is the line where uh, solar radiation is the highest. And the image that you see here is probably at around the uh, month of March. So this is the equator. This is 30 north. This is the Canary Islands. And this is the 30 south. Around the equator where the sun is beaming at its highest radiation, you get production, massive production of heat. The heat rises up. When it rises up, it cools down, condenses, and then you get rain. And that's why the tropics are so wet. Are these the wettest places on Earth? No, but they are really wet. As they rise up, they produce the rain, but then they remain in a higher uh, atmosphere location, creating these high pressure regions. So around 30, so if, if you are by the equator, let's see the next beautiful animation. I uh, uh, glued in some rain clouds, and as you move away from the uh, equator, the amount of rain decreases. Sorry. That happens because of these high pressure cells called the Hadley cells. Those cells will prevent the formation of rain cloud all the way until you reach more or less 30 north. Here the cold air sinks down, you get into a vortex of the uh, uh, jet stream, and this is the place where the rain is going to start again. In between, it's a desert. So, the intertropical convergence zone, this is the hottest place, where if you look at the satellite imagery, you'll see always a line of clouds that is moving depending on the season. You get all the uh, air flowing. These are the trade winds that are flowing towards the equator where they're going to rise up and produce rain. And then you're going to move into this Hadley cell where you don't, you're not getting any 
wind until it sinks down at 30 north. 30 north, you're going to get the formation of the westerlies. And westerlies produce rain. So how that relates to our Mediterranean climate? This is the ITCZ, Z, depending if you're American or English, Z or Z, in January. It's not in a straight line because it's affected by the land masses. This is an animation of the um, ITCZ and then the Hadley cells going north and south. So in the places of, uh, where it sinks down, you're going to get rain. The places that are within these Hadley cells, it's going to be high pressure, no rain. So we're now in winter time. Hadley cell is formed about the Sahara Desert. You're not going to get any rain in the Sahara Desert during winter time. And this is when the monsoons are affecting the southern hemisphere. The rain associated with the westerlies is going to affect the Mediterranean area. That's when Mediterranean climate is going to receive its rain. Or precipitation, if it's a cold place, it will be snow. In the summer, with the change in uh, the angle of the Earth relative to the uh, Sun, you see a shift of the ITCZ northward in July to its maximum northward location. And you see the Hadley cell forming above the Mediterranean. So this shift will create dry conditions in the Mediterranean during summertime. That's why it never rains in the Mediterranean. The places where you get the rain are places um, at the northern location of the Hadley cell where the air is starting to sink down. You might get a little bit of rain. If we're looking at map of Mediterranean areas or the oranges in this small uh, world map, you can see how those form beautifully in the places where you got the play of northward migration of the ITCZ and the Hadley cell north and south will determine you're getting rain or you're not getting rain. So this is a very solid system that exists for a very long time. And that's why the Sahara Desert is always under high pressure and you don't get any rain in it. The story with Mediterranean climate and C4 vegetation is a bit elusive because in Mediterranean climate, all the rain falls in the winter when the temperature is low. So the kind of flora that will develop, and these are grasses intentionally, those are wild barley, those grow in Mediterranean climate because the rain comes in the winter when the temperature is cold. Biomass productivity of C3 grasses is a lot higher than that of C4 grasses. Now, there are some exceptions in Mediterranean climate. I didn't write about it, and I should do it. You have microhabitats. This is southern slope in Mediterranean environment. Sorry, it's, the resolution is somewhat compromised in this image. I'm looking here to the west in this um, wadi in Mediterranean uh, climate. This is all C3 flora. This is a northern slope. I hope you can identify those as trees. And this is Mediterranean forest. The same environment on the southern slope. It looks a little bit more arid. It's not covered by the same dense vegetation. It's open. You hardly have any soil because it's steep. Here you'll have C4 grasses and succulents. But it's Mediterranean environment. This is a microhabitat. Does it appear in Mediterranean environment? Yes. Does it mean that we're in a desert? No, but these are unique conditions that allow this vegetation to grow there in a way that doesn't reflect the whole environment. But it's something that is important to put in mind because when we look for C4 markers, it might be that we're looking perhaps in something that might be misleading. Otherwise, in uh, the Near East, when you're looking for C4 vegetation, it will typically appear in the transition to the desert. If you're positioned in the borderline between Mediterranean climate and, and, and arid environments, the North Tropical Desert Belt, as you transition, you'll find in the arid environments 
um, a mix of C3 and C4 vegetation. And then in a hyper arid region, you find this uh, pretty ugly, grayish looking C4 canopods. So we're looking at two types of C4 vegetations, the grasses, sedges versus the canopods. And we're looking at expansion of uh, those kind of uh, vegetation under three climate scenarios. The first one is just aridification. You're so close to the desert, if the desert moves a little bit northward, you're going to get into desert conditions in what used to be Mediterranean environment. So you're going to see arid adopted C4 canopods replacing a, a more a water demanding C3 vegetation. The second uh, and third scenarios are associated with summer precipitation. We saw that right now what we're having is a very stable, solid, wet season cold, warm season dry Mediterranean climate. But what happened if you get summer precipitation? One scenario that was being suggested is southern migration of westerlies. So currently they are providing rain, not this year, but typically in uh, Europe. If those are pushed southward during glacial period, you're going to find grasses and sedges that like to grow in warm, wet conditions. This is what um, and some suggested. The other candidate for summer precipitation in the Mediterranean environment is northern migration of monsoons. If you have intensified monsoons, and those happen in specific cycles, when the insulation maximum is in 30 north, then you're going to get tropical grasses and sedges that are being pushed into regions from the south that otherwise would have been deserts. So, three scenarios. Um, I'm going to test those with the paleoclimate record. I'm starting with global climate. And the best record for a mid-late Pleistocene um, is coming from Antarctica. This is um, one of the major drills. There's Apica C, and there is uh, this one is from Vostok. It's adaptation from uh, adapted from uh, Luthi and Al, and it shows an amazing cyclical climate change in the center. You see delta D values, deuterium that will uh, reflect on temperature. The negative values is cold temperature, the less negative values means high temperature. When you compare that to greenhouse gases, and uh, this is something, a data, piece of data that climate change deniers usually uh, avoid, you'll see that there is a very uh, a narrow range of CO2 pressure that is changing over time and how that is connected to temperature. Look at the CO2 graph and this concentration in ppm, so parts per million. And look how beautifully it varies in relation to temperature that is measured in, in, in Antarctica. If you look at the higher part of this uh, uh, panel, you'll see methane production. You'll see that methane peaks also vary with temperature and CO2 pressure, but they're much more wobbly and noisy. This noise is very meaningful, and I'll explain that in a second. So, people always talk about these greenhouse gases, and why it's so important, because it's, it's, we're warming up, we're producing anthropogenically a, 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 a fossil fuels that is burnt, and it's increasing the, the atmospheric pressure of CO2. Today, we are here, above 400. Never been recorded in the last 800,000 years in Antarctica. So if someone thinks that this is a natural cycle of uh, warming, no, it's not. We're entering into a zone that is unknown to us in terms of the implications. With CO2 and temperature, we see that there are cycles of about 100,000 years. About 130,000 years ago, we we're in the last interglacial cycle where CO2 pressure is high, at its highest peak. We see that the temperature is at its highest peak 
And the same thing also with methane. And then we're descending down into a glacial cycle, and at the onset, the end of the last glacial maximum, we're rising up into a, a higher temperature, and the CO2 does the same. If you're looking back in time, 400,000 years and so, we see that there is 100,000 uh, year cycles. Those um, 100,000 year cycles are already quite steady in, since mid Pleistocene. And those determine the glaciation and, and deglaciations of landscapes in uh, colder environments and how that affects the climate in the rest of the world. If there's something that is unclear, you can stop me and ask me questions. I'm very happy to uh, expand. I'm, I'm sort of glossing through. So these are the glacials. So we're looking on, at Earth from the North Pole. This is a beautiful uh, scenery. Um, if you're interested in uh, Europe glaciation, it's secondary at best to what you find in the north, in, in, in North America. The Laurentide ice sheet is probably more than 80% of the global water is stored there. So everything else is secondary. This is most of the fresh water of the world was stored in this glacial, in last glacial maximum. When we're looking at the methane, these sort of seemingly erratic peaks are falling at cycles of about 21 to 23,000 years. And those associated with the way that Earth is wobbling around the sun, when is the timing that the warm season is going to be the closest to the sun? So it follows the 100,000 year cycles, but has this 20,000 year cycles. Why do we see this methane? The methane is the product of bacterial biomass productivity under anaerobic conditions when you cover the landscape with water in floods, in warm environments, in the tropics. That's where a lot of methane is being produced to the atmosphere. A secondary factor that will contribute to the rise of methane in the atmosphere is the thawing of a, a permafrost. So permafrost is another good source for methane, and when the uh, ice cap is melting, the permafrost is thawing, the methane from, from uh, wetlands is released to the atmosphere as well. And when is that, that happen? In the warmer period in a 100,000 year cycle. So this is the highest release of methane, few other strong releases of methane, dropping down, dropping down until we're ending the glacial cycle and it starts again, and it goes backwards. So this is a beautiful sort of mechanism, was explained already uh, uh, to some degree by Milankovic that calculated those, and uh, we find that it works beautifully with data that came after the calculation. So first someone conceived crazy ideas about uh, Earth orbital forcing about climate, and then we found the proxies that fit with the calculations, and that's unbelievable. Someone has to be super clever. The image that I'm showing you are uh, mega lakes. This is uh, Mega Lake Chad. These are giant bodies of water that are forming in the uh, um, uh, last deglaciation or the onset of the Holocene, where you have a peak of uh, solar radiation at 30 north. So, now I'm going to do some tying of a uh, monsoons, where you get large pulses of water flowing and how those migrate uh, northward, how that they are affecting the Mediterranean area. The first regional markers that I'm going to show here are subpropels. What are those subpropels? Subpropels are formed when the Nile is super flowing because it's an insulation maxima, uh, maximum event. So the Earth is tilted in such a way that it's in the closest location to the Sun when you get these events. The Earth is receiving a lot of radiation in a specific point um, that allows to hit the land, make a big difference between sea and land, and then you get a lot of rain produced. The Nile is flowing in a crazy way into the Mediterranean and pouring this fresh water. Those create a cap above circulating a saltier a Mediterranean Sea, 
it stops the circulation because of flow of uh, the fresh water and all the organics are now because of anoxic conditions everything dies and sink down and preserved in uh, nice mud layers or black layers called the sapropel they also smell uh, pretty bad so here is a sapropel see this black layer study on uh, sapropels and from now on I call them sap because it's just easier to write that the sapropels are dated and we see that they come in nice cycles and when you get a sapropel in the uh, Mediterranean Sea in cores they dig those they date those and then because of uh, the anaerobic conditions you get perfect preservation of plants so what are the plants that they find there these are not African plants those are Mediterranean plants so the water is coming from the Nile but the vegetation that you're analyzing is vegetarian that is coming from the eastern Mediterranean and you see these crazy pulses every time that you get this monsoon event and, and, and uh, you get accumulation of uh, uh, pollen and these are all pollen samples and you see uh, trees coverage and other maybe desert marker plants like canopods and, and artemisia and those coincide with the sapropel events and the sapropel events that were identified were dated to sapropel 5 it's 127 uh, thousand years ago 105 83 and then there is something that is not going on at all and at 11 the monsoons we saw that with the meth methane production and the measure of the concentration in in uh, Antarctica the rate of methane production drops as you go into glacial cycles so during glacial cycles you won't get these crazy monsoons they usually um, are happening during interglacials now I said that the vegetation that you see oaks oaks are not tropical oaks are Mediterranean so if uh, the water is flowing through a desert there's no problem and um, what you'll find is only oaks but some people are arguing that the rain is actually migrating northward so maybe to 20 north that makes sense or maybe 25 north or maybe 30 north and then people start asking themselves oh maybe you get a tail of the monsoons during insulation maxima events that actually browse the Mediterranean area and this kind of an argument comes time after time the next proxy that I'm going to show you is the local uh, cave spellothems this is all sedimentary bedrock you get beautiful karstic system evolving and then you get the formation of uh, caves karstic caves in them you get the growth of spellothems the ones that I'm going to show you now are coming from uh, uh, Pekin all this uh, sort of grayish bluish area this is Mediterranean area yellowish is transition to the um, steppic area and in the bottom this is all extreme deserts so the cave spellothems that are, are showing now are coming from the Mediterranean area those are formed uh, because of uh, the combination of water and CO2 this produces carbonic acid, carbonic acid melts the, the bedrock and eventually the calcite precipitates in these uh, uh, cavernous um, areas so these are the spellothems the spellothems record information about specifically for carbon isotopes this is CO2 that comes from the decay of vegetation or biomass above the cave so those decay in the soil by bacteria that produce CO2 the CO2 interacts with the rain that is fall in and this is what you measure in the cave so these are the three caves Pekin, Jerusalem and Sorek and they're all showing more or less the same information when you put it on a time scale they're dated with uranium series this is closed systems the dates are pretty good pretty good Jerusalem not so good but the rest are really well dated now if you look at those and the carbon isotope values 
you'll see that through most of the time they are within a certain steady range. The values vary by maybe two per mil. But in certain points of time, in the last 130,000 years, there are two events where those become really positive, and I mark those in blue. The first one is around 130,000 years ago, and the second one is about 10,000 years ago, slightly less. You see those? If I plot over it the temperature reconstruction from Antarctica, we see that the events where C4 or C4, or the signal become very positive, is associated with interglacial conditions. So very warm conditions, not cold conditions. In the interglacial round before the last glacial maximum and after that in the onset of the Holocene. The person that did most of the study on those caves, Mirabar Matthews, said, look, from my uh, information, the way that I interpret the data, the shift to positive values happens because there's so much rain that you get a stripping of the soils because of floods. And then the water that uh, falls above the cave interacts with uh, uh, the bedrock sediments and the values become more positive because this is the values typical we see in marine carbonates. So the shift towards more positive values is associated with the fact that it's really wet, not related to the plant that are uh, supposed to be producing the carbon signal otherwise. Opponents say, we think that these C4 shifts are associated with C4 vegetation that comes in during interglacials, or perhaps in some cases, Frumkin will say, also in glacial periods. So we're entering into a debate that is somewhat circular and somewhat unsolvable, unsolvable because it's very hard to tell those apart. You're getting one answer, but two different uh, uh, reasons. This is another important local a, a, a archive. This is the Dead Sea Basin. This is the modern Dead Sea. The lighter shade here shows Lake Lisan when it was much, much larger. And the black boundary line that you see here, this is the catchment area of the Dead Sea. Dead Sea is a crazy desert. It's a rain shadow desert. It's always a desert. The only waters that comes to it are coming from its a, a basin. So it might come from wet environments in the north, or from dry environments in the south where typically you don't get anything. So it's a very large catchment area, but not a lot of water because it's in the desert. This, there is a whole group of studies. I just show one of the latest by uh, Gil Torfstein, it's all from uh, 2015. They did a large project of coring hundreds of meters of uh, sediments from the Dead Sea Basin and there you can uh, analyze the accumulation of sediments in the bottom. The grayish area represents salt deposition. This happens when the lake is evaporating, it's shrinking down, it doesn't get a lot of water. The orange parts that you see in the rest of it, this is uh, produced when the uh, lake is rising and then you get aragonite and organic detritus that are forming laminas. So you can see periods that the lake is rising and becoming really large, and you can see periods when it's dropping down and becoming shrinking into what it is today. Pebbles, when there's no sea and you've got seashore, it means that it's really in bad state. It happens once in the uh, uh, 150,000 years record of this uh, uh, column. So. Sorry for this very messy graph. We'll see in the bottom there is Sorek Cave and the insulation cycle, so oxygen isotope and insulation. We see aragonite that is precipitated during wet periods, oxygen isotope values. We see the uh, change from addition to subtraction of the uh, lake levels associated with 
climate according to the authors. And then uh, you see an um, interesting period. And this happened around 130,000 years. And there is some discrepancy with the dates, but what they see in a period that is very dry because you, you get accumulation of chloride. So interglacial period, 130, the lake um, is drying, and in the center of it, there is a period where it rises up. And the date is when you get the Suppropel 5 event. Dead Sea rises in a dramatic way and a short event before it's dropping down again. If you look at the interglacial event that happens more recently, you see again drying of the lake. Glacial period, you see less of that, and rising of the lake. So they say glacial periods are pretty wet because the Dead Sea is rising, or like Lisan. In warm periods, it's drying. But you find this crazy anomaly 130,000 years ago when in a period where the lake is supposed to drop down, it rises up. And they say the only force that will bring all this water, if we're looking at monsoons, maybe it's a monsoon. And then, where is the water coming from? The north of the Mediterranean? No, all the desert areas that are part of the catchment probably provide a lot of water that otherwise won't be available to uh, help raise the sea level. So, they support the argument that what you see in the cave spell of them is actually incursion of C4 vegetation associated with monsoons. So, we have three different options for the expansion of C4. One of them is downward migration of the uh, uh, sea. Uh, of the westerly systems because of glacials, I'll show that in some data that we have our own data. Why the glacials are going to push rain systems southward during the summertime? It's because the large uh, ice sheets uh, produce local anticyclones or high pressure uh, areas that might deflect the jet stream and the westerly southward. What you see here as a Lego diagram is this is the North America and this is Europe and this is Africa, in case you were having a hard time conceptualizing uh, abstract art, cubism. But the reason that you see that, because this model was developed in the 1970s, early 1980s. So it was the biggest consortium of researchers, the COMA, and they produced models to try and estimate how the glacial conditions are going to affect climate systems. And what they found is that during the peak of LGM, you can uh, see a south migration, south migration of the jet stream bringing rain, cold rain, into otherwise right now desert regions that don't get the wind, the, this, this amount of precipitation. Gideon, yeah. The timing is wrong. Right? So it's slightly, la slightly late. Well, this this is this would your carbon isotope anomalies are really hol or late Pleistocene, really Holocene, right? Yes. And not LGM. True, but people were still arguing because um, one of the researchers that studied the cave in Jerusalem found also a C4 peak during glacial times. So he said, I'm almost wrong. Yes. I like butting heads with him. He's a very nice guy, but I disagree with him on a regular basis. So he thought that that might be the case. Because when you look, when you look in uh, the southwest, you'll see these uh, blue patches. Those are lakes that were formed because of the southern migration of the jet stream. So all the things that right now don't get that much rain got a lot of rain, and you get formation of crazy lakes like Lake Bonneville in Utah. Now you have these little salty lakes that represents once upon a time big freshwater lakes. This was a very different environment during glacial times. So people in the eastern Mediterranean said, oh, maybe we got the same thing. But the southern boundary of the Laurentide, of the biggest ice sheet, was about 40 north. It means that the glacial was advancing really to the south, 
and it's much bigger than what you find in Europe. So I'm testing scenarios for the possible expansion of C4 vegetation into otherwise Mediterranean landscape. If you'll see that, if it's a monsoon, you're supposed to get some savannas. It means our early modern humans migration might have migrated into savannas. So it's actually an appendicitis of Africa when you're in the Near East. So that's a possibility. My grad student Alex Brittingham is working in Armenia and is using plant waxes and other proxies to look at climate during a glacial cycle. So Armenia, sorry that I'm moving a little bit to the north. We're now at 40 north, not 30, 32 north. At 40 north, uh, you get uh, rain that is uh, concentrated in the Mediterranean area and there is uh, in Armenia, you're uh, getting the tail of that. And in the summer, the westerlies are pushed northward and Armenia is getting the tail of that as well. So Armenia's rain or precipitation falls predominantly between seasons. So either in the fall or in the spring. That's because of the shift of uh, uh, the jet stream and the westerlies on a seasonal basis. Makes, it's very simple, makes a lot of sense. But what happens where, when you have glacials that are affecting the jet stream? And this is something that COMAP didn't have the data to uh, look at that. They had a lot of data from North America, less data that is coming from Asia. Sorry, the eastern part of Europe. So here you have the anticyclones. Those are hypothetically deflecting the uh, westerlies southward, but by how much? A little bit. So Armenia is a great place to test that. This is the, the Levant area is hundreds, maybe thousand kilometers south of that. So it's not part of that game. So we wanted to test uh, that. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of data from one of the sites is working on quite a few of them. And this is associated with a study that Carolina is involved in for a different question about fire. And he extracted plant waxes, so and alkanes, from different uh, sediment units in the cave side of Lusikert in Armenia, excavated by my colleague Dan Adler. And the dates are tentative between 40 to 40 to 60,000 years ago. This is time uh, within a glacial cycle. There is a if you look at the hydrogen isotope as a marker of temperature, it starts cool, the temperature rise and then drop again within otherwise pretty cold cycle. The carbon isotope values that are uh, coming from uh, the site are increasingly becoming more uh, less negative. And I'll talk about it in one second. Because we're in a closer time slot, I can use the Greenland, the higher resolution Greenland ice core temperature data. And if I plot and reverse uh, Alex's data, here it is. It matches beautifully with a, a small cycle, which is part of the glacial cycle of uh, uh, the last hundred or so thousand years. So. Here we're in a reversed order, 100,000 to present. There is a cold phase warming up, cooling again, but the CO2 pressure is going down and we see also glaciation that is not, uh, is being forming and increasing in area. So what does he see in Armenia? He see in Armenia a shift of about eight per mil in carbon isotope values, those of waxes. And it seems to be that this shift of eight per mil is representing the reorganization of westerly system in glacial conditions. We do see a southward, southward migration of westerly system, but the migration is minute. You see it in Armenia, perhaps you see a little bit in Turkey, in the Near East, too far for that. So I don't find any mechanism that will bring rain in the summer during glacial periods into the uh, Near East. Armenia is 
Kuwait to the north, Armenia does see that, and that will be a big deal to uh, 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 frame that uh, when the study is completed. A second thing that people uh, uh, were uh, toying with the idea is aridification. When the climate is so arid, canopods become competitive, they cover landscapes. We see that today in deserts. It's not a, a complete transition, but a gradual transition that might affect carbon isotope uh, values. Again, I'm showing you the same map of precipitation and uh, the cave locations that we seen earlier was in the Mediterranean area. Now I'm going to shift to uh, uh, the south. This is Savoy Cave in the boundary between steppic and extreme desert environment. The top two panels are oxygen and carbon isotope values. I'm going to focus on the carbon because it's, otherwise it's, it becomes too, too wide to talk. In carbon isotope values, I'll put the line where C4 presence become evident if you're looking at flora. So Tsavok, which is in present place where you have mix of C3 and C4 plants, you also see those during glacial periods. So Rec Cave, if I put those as comparison and put the C4 lines, the only two places that you see a real appearance of a C4 in a massive way, it happens in the two dates of Sapropel 5 and Sapropel 1 interglacials. You never see a edification that brings the landscape to that, that you're going to be stripped from trees and it's turning into a desert. It doesn't happen in the Mediterranean. So this is not a good candidate for us. And the final candidate is monsoons. So the study that I'm going to show now is by Lara Sonia from 2013. And I'm not going to sort of, I'm not going to uh, say that this is uh, the majority view, but they are trying to model the expansion of uh, Green Sahara through direct precipitation over the Sahara in subpropel events or insulation maxima. So what you see in this uh, figure is vegetation cover Today, and this is when you look at um, Google Earth, you see that the Sahara is really barren. And the green area represents jungles. The brown area represents a mix of uh, woody vegetation that's mostly uh, wood and then also an uh, open landscape. Uh, above it, you get um, savannas, and above it, grasslands, and this is a stripped desert. And it uh, is associated with the amount of precipitation. Larisoni et al. did some modeling, uh, A, computer modeling, B, looking at a uh, presence, absence of uh, paleo lakes to look at the two uh, climate events, Sapropel 1 and Sapropel 5, that are the largest ones that produce green Sahara. So this is Sapropel 1. What they argue, based on paleo lake data, is that the uh, uh, strip of grassland and savanna expanded through at least half, half of the Sahara uh, and, and the grassland also uh, continued all the way into the corridor. But the amount of rain are very small. So this is not something that will affect uh, rains in the Near East that you'll get them expressed in cave spellosins. In Sapropel 5, they argue uh, that the intensification of the monsoon was so dramatic that rain and savanna covered all of uh, uh, the Sahara. It's based on some assumption, not everyone will accept that. And Again, also with some modeling, but that will create a candidate that will bring monsoonal rains into the Mediterranean region. And that happened 130,000 years ago. So some of the arguments of people who argue for monsoon says conditions are conducive for that. It means that modern humans are migrating out of Africa into, into a savanna landscape with also megafauna that is African. So they have quite a strong argument. If I'm looking 
at desert spelothemes. Those are not formed today, but formed at times that were wet enough. And for that, we're using uranium series dating on closed systems, so the dates are pretty good. And these are the desert spelothemes. Today, not enough rain, they will never form. The only times that you see formation of spelothemes in extreme desert are around 130,000 years ago. And one a group of dates from about 85,000 years ago. And how those married to subpropel events? They are. So you get wet periods in now extreme deserts. And those are taking place during periods of intensified monsoons. And once the monsoons are not strong enough, this remains a desert. So there is perhaps some support to that argument. So we're looking back at the case spelothemes. We see that there is two events of C4 incursions in those, and we don't know, is it the cave sediment or it's the flora above it? And it's possible that subpropel 5 is a period when you have monsoon that migrates into the Levant. But if you accept that argument, we don't have, in the same model, evidence for early Holocene migration of uh, monsoons into the Levant, but still we see these very positive carbon isotope values. Then who is right? You're sort of holding the same arguments, and one would say, no, this is a rain that it falls locally. And other would say, no, this is a monsoon, look at the values. So. We're in a bit of a limbo here, and I'll give you just the one, one last piece of evidence. So the people who say this is not C4, it's just a wet phase, because northern insulation will increase the, the energy that will produce humidity also locally and not because of monsoons. It's just the timing is the same timing. It's hard to decouple. So Mirabar Matthews that worked on Sorek Cave gives us a very interesting uh, piece of information. This is oxygen isotopes. And she's comparing oxygen isotope values in Sorek Cave to foraminifera that is uh, uh, being uh, uh, cored in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea and represent the isotopic composition of surface water. And what she shows that in cases where you have subpropel event 5, 3, and 1, you get a coinciding negative shift of oxygen isotope in the subpropel and in the cave. The subpropel represent, sorry, it's not the, the subpropel, the, the foraminifera, which is coming from the Mediterranean, is a source of water that feeds the cave. The evidence from the oxygen isotope values from the cave and from the subpropel, and from the Mediterranean Sea suggest that the rain is coming from there and not from the south. They won't coincide if the rain source is different. So, we're now stuck with uncertainties. And this is more or less the end of the talk, because it's not resolved. But how, how can you sort of get the head and tail of this kind of a situation? What you need is carbon isotope vegetation proxies that can get you out of the limbo if it's a cave or it's, or, or it's vegetation. And you want to find them in direct context with humans, because those are amazing paleoproxies in the Dead Sea and, and the caves, but they're not associated with human cultures. You have to do a link that doesn't always work. It's a lot more interesting to get the data directly from cultural context, where you have archaeological site and where you have the people that that's their profession to work on the bioproxies that are coming from cultural context. So one of the ways to test this uh, kind of scenarios is to use tooth enamel carbonate in grazing animals and browsers. So in the Near East you have a lot of gazelles, which is a mixed feeder in open landscapes. You have fallow deer that like forested environments, it's a browser. It also grazes, it's a mixed feeder. And you find equids and cows that are strictly grazers. If you take those insights where you find hominins at the time slot of 130,000 years ago, before and after, you can see if there is a change in the carbon isotope composition. There is one study that did that in one of the hominin sites with three goats. <laughs> 
and they saw a shift to C4 signal. I showed you a slide. The site is located facing a southern slope, rocky, steep landscape where the goats will browse, uh, uh, browse and graze. This is a place that today in Mediterranean environment you get C4 vegetation because of solar radiation that exists today. So you cannot say if you're using Go, this is not a good proxy for the presence of summer or winter rains. You need an animal that covers expansive landscapes and that will give you a better proxy. Second thing is to look at plant and alkanes in the way, the same way that my student did in Armenia, to do it also in Near Eastern sites, because those are coming from direct proxy from the plants themselves. Those can come from secured sediment context to look at changes in uh, C3, C4 uh, flora, and also to look at the length of the chains that will give us information about herbaceous versus woody vegetation. So that is something in, in the making right now. And after having the great tour in Carolina's lab, I see already the prospects of a possibility for a collaboration to work on, that, on those uh, sites because I'm getting a PhD students that will focus on some of these questions. So finally, I would like to thank Carolina for the invitation to present today and also to uh, Laguna, La Laguna University for hosting the workshop. Thank you very much.